motorsport isn't rational. There's no fundamentally good reason to race fast cars around loops of varying size and complexity. For most competitors, it's also a pretty thankless endeavour. Loss after loss, little recognition, and often nothing to show for it other than less money than you had to begin with. But it's exciting. It's exciting to race, exciting to have a chance at glory, a chance to be the best. It's easy to understand then why passionate drivers are compelled to race, but what compels a company? Nissan, one of Japan's big three automakers, always seemed drawn to competition. Motorsport is a bold and risky exercise for any company, but for Nissan in the 1980s it seemed nothing short of crazy. Public perception of their road cars was sinking as their available products got increasingly boring and docile. The company had an image problem, and in the highly competitive car market, an image problem can quickly become a money problem. In 1982, the FIA introduced a new prototype category to stitch together Group 5 and Group 6. Group 5 was a category comprising closed cockpit touring car style cars, which weren't really touring cars and had very little to do with road cars, but kind of still looked related. Group 6, on the other hand, was an open cockpit sports car category. The two would be merged to create Group C, a top flight closed cockpit sports car category that would see manufacturers from across the globe battle on track in some of the fastest racing machines ever built. Group C was devised mostly around European endurance racing, forming the basis for the FIA World Endurance Championship WEC, starting in 1982, which would then be renamed to the World Sports Car Championship or WSC in 1985. But there was also significant regulatory overlap with IMSA's GTP class and the proposed 1983 All Japan Endurance Championship, which would use the same Group C formula exactly. Group C was a lot of things, but two things it definitely wasn't was boring and docile. While all this change was going on in the early 80s, Nissan had been competing in the soon-to-be-defunct Group 5 class in a series known as Super Silhouette. It was called this because the cars were just space-frame chassis with bodies draped over the top that were vaguely the same shape as road cars. The Super Silhouette formula was around from 1979 to 1984, with Nissan entering in a car that was supposed to look like an R30 Nissan Skyline in 1982, a car that would be campaigned by Nissan racing legend Masahiro Hosemi's Hosemi Motorsport until the series ended. I usually don't do this, but I have to tell you that information about this car and Super Silhouette in general is really sparse. I struggled to find good sources, so take this information with a pinch of salt. The car was classic Group 5, a steel tubular space frame chassis with a sort of Skyline-esque body hanging off of it. Powering the car was a twin-turbo 2.1-litre inline four-cylinder engine capable of generating around 560 horsepower. During its three years of competition, the Skyline Super Silhouette was really quite successful in its class, chalking up a fair few wins. Wikipedia says it was 8, my math says it was 9, but either way, having only competed in 17 events, that gives the Skyline a win rate of around about 50%. But Super Silhouette was relatively niche, particularly internationally. While it certainly enjoyed a reasonable degree of popularity at the time for what it was, the newly introduced and quickly globalizing Group C offered a far larger platform for Nissan to flex their sporting muscle. As luck would have it, they already had a lightweight, powerful and proven prototype racing chassis. So the Skyline Super Silhouette space frame got a fresh new body, creating the not-so-new Nissan Skyline Turbo C. The 1983 Skyline Turbo C was powered by the same twin-turbo inline-4 as the Silhouette, which stayed in front of the cockpit despite the new sports car styling, which made it the only front-engine Group C car. This wasn't just a novelty, but a real problem for its drivers, who suffered from the consequences of poor cooling as heat from the engine spilled mercilessly into the cabin. In addition to the Skyline Turbo C, operated by Hasemi Motorsport, two other Nissan-powered Group C cars were introduced in 1983. The first was the Nissan Fairlady ZC, built around a more appropriate LM03C chassis courtesy of Le Mans Garage and powered by the same 2.1-litre engine as the Skyline, 
Central 20 avoided the Skyline's big weakness by mounting the engine in the middle of the car, behind the cockpit, crucially, in a more traditional Group C layout. The same is true for the third entrant, run by Hoshino Racing. They too used the same engine, but sought yet another chassis supplier, competing with a March 83G. So, just to summarise, there were three Nissans, operated by three different teams, using three different chassis, but all using the same engine. Asami Motorsports, Skyline Turbo C, Central 20's Fair Lady ZC, and Hoshino Racing's Sylvia Turbo C. All three made their Group C debut at the third and final round of the 1983 All Japan Endurance Championship. The Fair Lady ZC and Skyline Turbo C both failed to finish, but the March-based Sylvia Turbo C did complete the event. Hoshina Racing managed 7th place, which doesn't sound too impressive, but for context, every single one of the six cars that beat it was a Porsche 956. Back again for 1984, the Sylvia Turbo C and Fair Lady ZC remained unchanged from the previous year. However, the mobile oven was gone, and a new entrant equipped with a brand new March 84G chassis appeared, the Nissan Panasport Turbo C. Results that year weren't very good. And despite Hasemi Motorsport reviving the Skyline Turbo C name for their LM04C based car, the best finish of any of them was 12th place. The cars were suffering from constant reliability issues, almost always engine related, and with such short seasons, none of the entrants could build any real momentum. For 1985, Panasport, Central 20 and Hasemi Motorsport all opted to use the LM04C chassis, while Hoshina Racing stood alone, continuing to use the March. This proved not to be a problem, as in the opening round at Suzuka, Hoshina Racing managed to come second, by far and away the best finish yet for any of the Nissan-powered machines. With Panasport in fifth, maybe things were beginning to look up. Not content with the progress, however, all of the teams swapped their chassis from round three. Asami Motorsport and Hoshina Racing chose the March 85G, Panasport the LM05C and Central 20 ditched the trend completely and partnered with Lola. This didn't immediately work out for any of them, as the middle of the season saw even top 10 finishes become scarce. But in round 5, all that changed. At the 1985 thousand kilometers of Fuji, Hoshina Racing scored Nissan's first victory in Group C, finishing a lap ahead of second place, which was also Nissan-powered, courtesy of Panasport. Despite an uninspiring final round which saw accidents for a couple of the runners, Nissan's maiden victory was now out of the way, proof they weren't a floundering backmarker any longer. Maybe a championship wasn't so far out of reach. 1985 marked an important turning point for Nissan both on and off the track as Yutaka Kume became the company's new president. He was keenly aware of Nissan's poor brand image and was convinced that motorsport was a way of proving to the public that they made more than boring boxes. This would lead to huge investment into the Mark's sporty road offerings and Group A touring cars to match, but with Group C slash GTP still very much the order of the day in North America and Europe, the prototype racing program's success remained an important piece of Kume's vision for reinventing the brand. Nissan was compelled to race, and the game was on. While the Nissan-powered cars were finding redemption in Japan, first steps were being taken across the Pacific to field a Nissan-powered car in the IMSA GTP class. Nissan were competing in the GTU class with more pedestrianized GT cars, but were yet to take the plunge into the prototype class. The car would be based around the same Lola T810 chassis as Central 20's JEC car, was developed with the aid of Electromotive Engineering, and would be entered under the model name GTP ZXT. The ZXT also represented Nissan's departure from the 2.1-litre inline-4, moving instead to a turbocharged 3.0-litre V6. The block was similar to that of the 300ZX for homologation reasons, but was as extensively modified as it could be to cope with the stress of racing. What's that for? Speeding. Oh. This engine would be shared by the GTO class 300ZX in later years as well. 
The ZXT made its racing debut at Laguna Seca, where it very much just kind of existed, finishing 8th in the GTP class and 11th overall, behind a couple of the lower class light cars. The car, only one of which had been built at this point, suffered a major accident in practice at the following event, causing it to have to miss a significant chunk of the remainder of the season. Once it had returned from round 11 in Portland, the mediocre results kept rolling in. This wasn't a failure for Nissan though, they weren't expecting to perform right off the bat. Instead, 1985 was much more about ironing out the creases as they ramped up their prototype racing program. Over in Japan, Nissan Motorsport, better known as Nismo, would enter a fully-fledged factory effort for the first time in 1986. Based on a March chassis and powered by the same 3.0-litre V6 as the GTP ZXT, the Nissan R85V represented a renewed determination by Nissan to succeed in Group C. The R85V wasn't alone though with Central 20 running a very similar car to the ZXT based on the same Lola chassis, and Hoshina Racing was entrusted to test the R86V using the most up-to-date March chassis, all used the same engine. This new V6 was way better than the old i4. At the opening round of the 1986 JEC, none of these three cars managed to finish, all retiring early on with the R86V failing to even start due to a fire. Round 2 was better, with Nismo finishing on the podium in 3rd and both other cars actually seeing the chequered flag. Unfortunately, the rest of the season was familiar failure for Nissan, with the transmission now encountering a lot of issues and FIA WSC overlap races being total write-offs due to the influx of insurmountable competition. Nismo actually took the R85V and R86V to a European event, the big one the 24 Hours of Le Mans, the ultimate endurance challenge. With predictable results, the R86V retired with a duff gearbox and the R85V, also encountering problems, crawled to the end of the race, finishing 83 laps behind the winning Porsche 962C. For clarity, yes, they were competing in the same class. The ZXT was missing from the first couple of IMSA races that year, clocking in from round three, what followed was a litany of double-digit finishing positions and DNFs, not to mention the many races Electromotive Engineering simply chose not to compete in, all until round 12 in Portland, where, for the first time in its IMSA career, the ZXT nabbed a podium finishing spot. Fourth in the race afterwards, buoyed the team, giving hope that they'd been liberated from the doldrums of poor performance, until the car suffered an engine failure at Road America. The rest of the season didn't see a major recovery. 1986 hadn't been Nissan's year, but having competed in such a wide variety of events, they had surely learned a lot. The only way was up. For 1987, they cranked up the budget and switched the engine yet again for their European and Japanese efforts, this time to an aluminium 3-litre turbocharged V8, paired with March's newest 87G chassis and called the R87E, what could possibly go wrong? For Nismo, the goal was simple. They had their sights set on Le Mans. However, Nismo didn't have a monopoly on running Nissans with Hoshino Racing getting their hands on a new R87E, while older Nissans continue to compete in Japan, where the competition had now been renamed from the All Japan Endurance Championship to the All Japan Sports Prototype Championship, or JSPC for short. Of the two rounds the Hoshino Racing run R87E competed in before Nismo debuted theirs at Le Mans, the car retired from both with mechanical failures. And, in a surprise to absolutely nobody who has listened to a word I've said up to this point, the same happened at Le Mans, with the car succumbing to an engine failure. Given that the point of failure had been, you know, the engine, the team was quick to request that it be replaced yet again, and so work began on designing a totally brand new engine for Nissan's Group C program. They didn't compete in any other WSC races, and the rest of the JSPC season was poor too, with Nissan's best finish being 8th place, hardly a year to remember. On paper, Nissan had gone backwards with the R87E, trading in occasional contention for almost total cataclysm, but they had learned a lot, and the pieces were starting to come together of a much more serious car. Over in the US, the ZXT managed to buck the trend, 
winning its first GTP race at the second round in Miami. Electromotive Engineering had managed to beat Porsche's formidable 962, there was hope yet. Unfortunately, this was followed by a couple of accidents, and in addition to the team continuing not to compete in some of the longer events, their next classified finish was in round 6. It was only 5th place. This kind of summed up the rest of the ZXT's season. Middling performance, occasionally interrupted by mechanical failure. But with a win under their belt, it was clear that the team and car was capable of more. After their maiden win, there was an appetite to invest more in the IMSA program. As such, Electromotive Engineering had the money to start building their own chassis for the cars, allowing for easier upgrade paths compared to relying on Lola. On the other side of the world, Nismo got the new engine they wanted, a specially designed twin-turbo 3.0-litre V8 that could consistently produce nearly 750 horsepower with that number climbing to over 900 horsepower in its highest tune. They would sometimes use this for qualifying sessions. Nismo also folded in Hashino and Hasemi for their JSPC effort, running two R88Cs under the Nismo banner with no additional runners. They weren't messing about going into 1988. Neither of the new cars would reach the end of the opening round, both suffering electrical failures but round two would see some encouraging signs as they came home sixth and ninth. It seemed almost a given that Porsche would lead the championship, but Nissan could now maybe fight Toyota at least. The story was similar again at the following round in Fuji, with Nissan coming seventh and eighth behind the Porsches and one of Toyota's 88 Cs. Even just across two events, Nissan hadn't seen this kind of consistency in a long time. Before the fourth round of the JSPC was the main event. Le Mans time had come back around. While the new car broke down less often than its predecessors, it was clear even from the JSPC events it had competed in that the R88C was not likely to set the world alight in France. But I'd have to imagine that even with that in mind, they were hoping for more than they got. One of the cars suffered an engine failure about two thirds of the way through, pinning all Nismo's hopes on their second car, which wasn't looking too good itself. The car came 13th in the C1 class and 14th overall, finishing five laps behind the leading C2 car that claimed victory in the lower class. Nissan were 50 laps behind the winning C1 car, which was for the first time at Le Mans since the Group C rules were introduced, not a Porsche. Jaguar's XJR9 had dethroned them, Nissan was barely on the same planet. Then the JSPC was back underway. Round 4 was the Fuji 500 and Nismo's R88Cs were still lagging behind Porsche, finishing 3rd and 5th, split by a Mazda 767. Round 5 was more of the same, and then round 6, which functioned also as round 10 of the WSC, was disappointing for Nissan, who found themselves losing out to Porsche and Jaguar yet again, as well as Sauber Mercedes and their C9. The year was panning out differently for the IMSA effort, however, with the ZXT claiming victory in round 4 at Road Atlanta, and then another at the next event in West Palm Beach, then a third victory in a row at the 150 laps of Lime Rock. I'm not done yet either, it won the Mid-Ohio 500km too, then round 8 at Watkins Glen, then it won again at the Road America 500. So far, that was 6 wins in a row. I guess that extra investment was worth it after all. Do you want to know the craziest part? I'm still not done. It carried on winning at the next race in Portland, where Electromotive Engineering scored their first 1-2. Yes, they now had a second car as well. Then, round 11 at Sears Point went their way as well. The final three rounds of the year went to various Porsche teams, but nothing could undo the sheer domination of the Nissan GTP ZXT. The Drivers' Championship was won by Jeff Brabham, lead driver at Electromotive Engineering. 1988 had been a highlight year for Nissan's Group C slash GTP efforts, thanks pretty much exclusively to an outrageously successful IMSA campaign. It showed that the Porsche and Jaguar machines were beatable with the right tools, but how easily repeated was the feat? For 1989, Nismo would develop the R89C, they moved from the March chassis to the same Lola chassis that had proven successful for the ZXT in IMSA. And just to be extra sure, they also replaced the engine yet again. 
this time to a 3.5-litre twin-turbocharged V8. With confidence high, they decided to compete in several WSC rounds on top of those that already overlapped with JSPC. Not just Le Mans, but others too. And with the ZXT still championing Nissan and IMSA, they had all bases covered. The R89C made its racing debut at the second round of the WSC in Dijon. Nismo entered a single car, and it came a very, meh, 15th place. Le Mans, not part of the championship in 1989, but still exceptionally important for the teams, was contested by three R89Cs. Unfortunately, things got off to a rocky start, as one of their cars was out with a crash only an hour into the race. Then, ten hours later, they lost a second car, this time thanks to an engine failure, an all too familiar state of affairs for the team. This left Nismo with just one car left in the race, and devastatingly, despite all their best efforts, in the 17th hour, that car too suffered an engine failure, leaving Nissan with nothing left. Round 3 of the World Sports Car Championship was forgettable, then the car suffered an accident in round 4 and ran out of fuel in round 5. It hadn't been a dream start to the car's first full season European entry. Round 6 was less terrible, in fact, it was decidedly alright, with Nismo finishing on the podium, then repeating it in round 7 too, before tumbling back down the order in the final race of the year. While racing in Europe hadn't exactly gone to plan, Nissan had been racing on two other continents, so how did they do? Well, in the JSPC, they were using the old R88C for the first two races, which lost to Porsche. From round 3, they introduced the R89C, which continued to lose to Porsche, as well as Toyota and a handful of Group A cars too, thanks to some good old reliability issues. That's their year in Japan out the way then, how about America? Despite an engine failure at the Daytona 24 hours, the ZXT was back to its winning ways in Miami, finishing two laps ahead of the second place Jaguar XJR9. And, much like the previous year, this win wouldn't stand alone as they won at Sebring and Road Atlanta too. West Palm Beach gave everyone a breather, with Electromotive Engineering coming a merciful sixth place to allow someone else a shot, before returning right back to total annihilation, winning the next four races in a row. In Portland, they managed second and third, losing to the newly introduced Jaguar XJR10 before going on another three-race win streak. Of the 15 races that made up IMSA 1989, 10 of them were won by the ZXT, once again securing them the championship and handing Jeff Brabham another driver's championship. Once again, Nissan's year had been kept afloat by the astonishing winning force of Electromotive Engineering, which for 1990 would be renamed to Nissan Performance Technologies Incorporated, or NPTI. NPTI set about developing a car to replace the ludicrously successful ZXT, anticipating the competition finally catching up to them. The car would be called the NPT90, but wouldn't be ready for the start of the IMSA season. Nissan's efforts in Europe and Japan would be built around the new R90C platform. The R90C, very innovative name I know, was really two different cars. Built in Europe was the R90CK, an evolution of the R89C that made some changes but also kept quite a lot the same. The biggest functional change was the reworking of the transmission tunnel to allow for wider and deeper Venturi tunnels to be sculpted into the floor of the car, increasing its ground effect downforce. The second car was the version built in Japan, the R90CP. This car was much more radically different than its European sibling, sharing almost no external surface with the old R89C, inheriting the cockpit and the engine with little else besides. The R90CP represented a total aerodynamic overhaul, much more aggressive looking and sharp than its predecessors, reflecting elements of some of Group C's most successful cars. Both these versions used the same 3.0-litre V8 the R89C had, producing an average of around 800 horsepower in race trim. The cars weighed in at just 900 kilograms, the class limit. In the 1990 JSPC, Nismo would enter two R90CPs with one additional entry from Cabin Racing. Their car was entered as an R90V, which I'm pretty sure was a European spec R90CK, but I can't confirm this. Round 1 saw Nismo number 24 come second place to a Toyota 90CV. 
If nothing else, this showed that Nissan and Toyota had finally truly outdeveloped the Porsche 962. The following round was stopped due to the weather before the number 24 Nismo took victory in round 3, ahead of the second place Porsche by two laps. Toyota had been afflicted by some reliability trouble. Round 4 was much the same, except this time it was the number 23 R90CP that took victory at Suzuka. Nissan were properly on the front foot now. Then, with yet another victory for the number 24 car at Sugo, the question wasn't whether Nissan would win the championship, it was which Nissan would win the championship. Nismo number 23 needed to beat the number 24 car by a lot in the final round to score victory. They came second place, beating the fifth place finish of the number 24 car. They ended the season tied on 67 points each, but thanks to the number 24 car winning two races to number 23's single race win, the number 24 Nismo R90 CP of Masahiro Hasemi and Anders Olofsson took championship victory, with Nissan claiming the championship for makes. At long last, Nissan had built a car not just fast enough to win, but reliable enough to prove it beating Toyota and Porsche to JSPC glory. In the WSC, Nismo's European outfit entered the new R90 CK from round 2. Having contested the first round with the old R89C effectively as a placeholder, they entered two cars, one of which ran out of fuel at Monza, the other finishing a middling 7th place. The next couple of races were very much the same, with the cars never quite able to make a meaningful impact on the race. Between round 4 and 5 was the 24 Hours of Le Mans, a race in which once again Nissan was keen to make progress. To that end, they entered more cars. Nismo entered an R90 CP to be driven by Hisemi Hashino and Toshio Suzuki, while Nismo collaborated with NPTI to enter two R90 CKs, with two more entered by Nismo Europe. If that wasn't enough, the Privateer Courage outfit entered the race with two old R89Cs as well, and Team Le Mans followed suit with an R89C of their own. The start was not good, with one of the CKs retiring due to a transmission failure on the pace lap. Good job they had three others, I suppose. Once the race was underway, it became clear quite quickly that the Japanese R90CP was superior to the R90CKs, being run by NPTI and Nismo Europe. It was fighting at the front, while the CKs dropped back significantly, despite the number 24 R90 CK of Nismo Europe qualifying on pole position. 12 hours in, and that formerly pole-sitting car was now out, also due to a transmission failure. It had at least done better than the first one. Then, 5 hours later, NPTI lost a car, this time to a failed fuel cell. The 24-hour challenge was beginning to take its toll. What remained of the factory-entered cars were a single R90CK and the R90CP. The CK finished the race, surviving the gruelling ordeal, but only managed 17th place. The R90CP, however, fared much better, fighting with Toyota and Porsche at the front of the field, eventually coming 5th place. Nobody able to compete with the might of Jaguar's XJR12. The remainder of the WSC season followed this same pattern for Nissan. The R90 CK was a decent car, scoring a couple of podiums towards the end of 1990, but never able to lead the pack. As had become IMSA tradition, the ZXT floundered at the outset before reasserting itself in Miami and going on a streak. After Miami, NPTI went on to win the next three rounds, then conceding rounds 6 and 7. Round 8 at Mid-Ohio saw the introduction of NPTI's shiny new NPT90, which won straight out the gate, beating its predecessor, which came second. The NPT90 then won the next race too, but before it could totally destroy another year, it became clear that Eagle Toyota had a car not far off Nissan's pace. Jaguar weren't too far away either. The NPT90 would take victory at Road America later in the year, but the gap had shrunk. Nissan still won the Manufacturers' Championship by a healthy margin, and Jeff Brabham won his third Drivers' Championship in a row, but the NPT90 hadn't proven to be as all-conquering as the ZXT had been in previous years. 1990 had been a fantastic year for Nissan. They'd found a rhythm, but just as things were beginning to fall into place, the landscape was starting to shift. 
1991 saw the introduction of Group C's controversial 3.5-litre formula. Group C sports car racing was exceptionally popular in the late 80s and into 1990, in no small part due to the variety of machines allowed and encouraged to compete by the regulations and overlap across Europe, America and Japan. FIA leadership wanted to have their cake and eat it too, or at least that's the way that it seemed. They wanted the success of the WEC specifically to be shared with Formula 1. The new 3.5-litre formula, which would see the C1 class restricted to naturally aspirated 3.5-litre engines, with cars that didn't meet the new requirements being forced to compete in the C2 class with heavy restrictions, were a copy and paste job from F1's rulebook at the time. The claim was that the change would introduce new engine supplies to F1 and allow F1 constructors to compete in the WSC more easily and cost-effectively should they choose to do so. The more cynical view is that it was an attempt to purposefully damage the WSC, bringing over a couple of new engine supplies to Formula 1 and ending any risk that the World Sports Car Championship may exceed F1's popularity. Whether you believe that depends mostly on who you believe was really pulling the strings behind the scenes at the time, we may never know for certain. Regardless of the intention, the results spoke for themselves, as the rule changes were effectively a death blow to Group C sports car racing in Europe due to the enormous increase in development costs associated with the new formula. Many manufacturers bailed out fast and the writing was on the wall, but some stuck it out, keeping it alive a little longer yet. Nissan didn't really fancy trying to force their V8 to make the same amount of power without its turbos, and so they withdrew from the World Sports Car Championship in 1991. But there was more racing to do than that. They very much stayed put in JSPC, upgrading their cars slightly to create the R91 CP, which was fundamentally the same car as previous year's car, with only minor tweaks. Nismo would enter two cars, the number 23 of Kazuyoshi Hoshino and Toshio Suzuki, and defending champions Masahiro Hasemi and Anders Olofsson in car number one. Notably, Nova Engineering took an R90CK and upgraded it independently to create the R91CK, and Team Le Mans bought an R90CP and upgraded that independently, dubbing it the R91VP. In America, NPTI was working on the NPT-91 to thwart the threat of Jaguar and Toyota in IMSA. The car wouldn't be ready until midway through the season, so the season started out with the old NPT-90. For Daytona, NPTI entered four Eurospec R90CKs from the previous year, believing they had a better chance to complete the 24-hour race than the NPT-90. The cars were classified in the LM class, and in that class, they won, though they were the only team contesting it. They were really fighting against the GTP cars. The regulations were very similar, and so overall, the best finishing Nissan managed a still impressive second place, losing to Yost Racing and their damn Porsche 962. At West Palm Beach, Nissan reverted to the NPT90, and this time Jaguar got the better of them reaffirming their need to upgrade to the NPT-91 as soon as possible. Despite not having the newest car, Nissan were able to take a 1-2 finish at Sebring before losing out to Jaguar in Miami. Both Nissan and Jaguar introduced new cars from round 5. Nissan's NPT-91 would go head-to-head -head with Jaguar's XJR-16. The cars were nip and tuck for the next four rounds, grabbing two wins each, before the latter part of the season saw the Eagle Toyota lurch back towards the front, threatening both. Nissan fell back furthest of the three frontrunners, unable to score another win that year. Despite this increased competition, the strong consistency of Nissan's cars, something that could not have been said about their early GTP attempts, allowed Jeff Brabham to win yet another championship, ahead of second place Chip Robinson, who was also driving for Nissan. Over in Japan, Nissan came out the gate swinging, with Nismo's number 23 R91CP winning the opening round at Fuji ahead of the R91CK. Then round two as well, this time with second place falling into the hands of Nismo's car number one. The R91CP was on top of the world. Round three was the 500 miles of Fuji, and it was a disaster for Nissan. Just 11 laps into the race, Team Le Mans driver Taka Wada in the privately entered Nissan R91 VP had a tyre blowout on the start-finish straight. As Wada lost control of the car, the underside caught the wind, flipping the car up into the air before sliding into the gravel trap and bursting into flames. 
Miraculously, Wada was okay after the accident, and the race continued on. About two hours later, Nismo's number one R91CP in the hands of Hisami had almost exactly the same accident, in almost exactly the same place, without the fire at least this time. Once again, the driver was relatively unharmed, despite the violence of the crash. The Toyota 91 CV that had been following Hisami at the time of its crash went on to win the race. Toyota won the next couple of races too, with Nismo picking up one last win for the season at the penultimate round. Nismo had done enough to win again. R91 CP number 23, driven by Hoshino and Suzuki, claimed championship victory. Just two points ahead of Toyota Team Tom's drivers Hitoshi Ogawa and Masanori Sakia. Accidents aside, it had been another good year for Nissan, though there's no denying that the lead they had over their rivals in both IMSA and JSPC in years gone by was beginning to shrink. But more existential than this was the fate of the very regulations themselves. With Group C gutted in Europe, how long would it survive in Japan and the States? Pretty much everyone was in agreement that Group C's time in the sun was coming to an inevitable end. Manufacturers like Nissan, who had chosen not to make the move to naturally aspirated 3.5 litre cars, were avoiding spending too much more money to develop their machines. The 1992 R92CP was a continuation of the previous year's car, with few changes. While in Europe, the naming convention was that naturally aspirated 3.5 litre cars were categorised as C1, with older non-compliant cars categorised as C2, in Japan the old cars were categorised as C1, and the 3.5 litre naturally aspirated cars were categorised as just Group C, with no number. I believe this was done because there was far fewer naturally aspirated 3.5 litre cars competing in the JSPC, and I also don't believe the JSPC had a penalty system for older cars, the same way the WSC did. However, I'm not 100% sure on that front. The reluctance to invest was true in IMSA as well, with the feeling being that GTP had probably run its course by now. That didn't mean there wasn't good racing to be done though. At the 1992 Daytona 24 hours, Nissan rolled out the big guns. The R90 CK had managed second the previous year, but they had better machinery, they just needed to get it there. Nismo International fielded an R91 CP, while NPTI entered a couple of old R90 Cs. No points for guessing which idea worked better. The R91 CP, driven by Hasemi, Hoshino and Suzuki, took overall victory at Daytona, beating the second place Jaguar XJR12 by 9 laps, and setting the fastest lap at 1 minute 38.5. The rest of NPTI's IMSA season was contested by the slightly modified NPT91A and B, which won in Miami before spending the rest of the season getting trounced by the All-American Racers Eagle 3 Toyota. In Japan, the R92CP of Hoshino and Suzuki spent the first four rounds cruising to win after win, though by this point in the championship's history, there was only three manufacturers contesting the series those being Nissan, Toyota, and the ever-optimistic Mazda. For the final two rounds, however, Toyota threw a spanner in the works, bringing in the TSO10 they had built for the C1 class in Europe. Nissan's car was already several years old under the skin by this point, and couldn't compete with the cutting-edge Toyota, which won the final two rounds, not just of the 1992 JSPC, but of the JSPC full stop. 1992 would be the final year of the competition's existence, as, just like what was happening to the WSC at the same time, the series collapsed due to a lack of substantive competition and manufacturer interest. Kazuyoshi Hoshino won the C1 Drivers' Championship, the last to be awarded by the series. In 1993, factory support vanished from IMSA GTP, leaving the NPT90 in the hands of the private Momo outfit for what would be GTP's final season. The car, which now saw little in the way of upgrades to try and catch up to Eagle Toyota, didn't win a race that year, often hovering around the podium but unable to achieve the greatness that had defined so much of Nissan's time in the class. With both the JSPC and World Sports Car Championship now gone, and IMSA confirming that the GTP class would be wound down, 1993 was the last year Group C held any significant relevance, albeit much diminished compared to its peak at the end of the 80s. In Japan, the once great Group C Nissans had their final fight at round 3 of the new JGTC at Suzuka, winning 
but in a class that was quickly becoming a relic of a bygone age. Teams and drivers moved on to the rising GT class, leaving Group C to the history books. Despite the somewhat unsatisfying ending, where the once great titans of a motorsport golden age just kind of quietly fizzled out of existence, Nissan's story is of undeniable success. Despite it not making much sense on paper, the passion of individuals cultivated a passionate company, willing to take risks and push the envelope in furtherance of sporting greatness. This attitude gave rise to the conditions necessary for Nissan to create one of the greatest racing machines of all time. You can learn all about the R32 Nissan Skyline GTR here. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the Automobilistic channel for more videos like this one. Thanks again for watching, and until next time, goodbye.